Um, we're going to get into that in just a few minutes. Um, a lot of times they're grouped together in what is called uh, Psalms of Trust. Um, but um, you will probably remember that when we did Psalm uh, Psalm 91, I shared with you some miraculous stories from Psalm 91, and uh, there were just some amazing things. That was the week when we talked about a soldier who was shot by a bullet, and it went all the way through his Bible and landed at Psalm 91, verse number 7, which said, a thousand may fall at your right hand, ten thousand at your left hand, but it will not come nigh you. The bullet was just pointing at that verse as if to say, God just protected you. And we heard several amazing stories like that. Well, I've got another amazing story to add to that. And I want to use um, just a, a moment to give you an update on Zach and tell you um, some incredible things that have been happening in his life. First off... This is the book by Kay Burnett. She's our National Women's Ministries Director. It's just brand new. It's called Voyage, Trusting Jesus in Uncharted Waters. And it's all about going on a, a ship ride and uh, facing turbulence and going through smooth sailing and all kinds of things like that. But in the last chapter, uh, she talks about what to do when you face shipwreck. When there's shipwreck, it's every man for himself. You get on a piece of floating wood, whatever you can just do to get to shore. And in it, she tells Zach's story. And this will be uh, one of the books that we're using this next go-round um, in our equip classes. And um, it's really amazing that, that uh, Zach's story is included in there. And then also, I wanted to mention, a lot of you may have saw it today on Facebook, John Caleb Allered is a a phenomenal pastor of a church in Springfield, Missouri. Um, he did a lot of time in prison. God delivered him from drugs. He, um, he, he has a staff that is uh, comprised of people who have in their background a lot of different, um, you know, faults and failures. In fact, not, not too long ago, when they were hiring pastoral staff, he put a post on Facebook saying, usually when you have a felony in your background, it disqualifies you, but this is one job in which it might actually help you to get the job. <laughs> and, um, but it's a phenomenal story. And anyway, Pastor John just wrote a book that's uh, titled, My Prison Became My Palace, and it's his story. Um, Zach wrote a letter to him, um, and, and it... Um, got to him this morning, Pastor John posted John's, posted Zach's picture and the letter on his Facebook page. I would really encourage you to read it, but it just tells him, Pastor John, thank you because your book ministered to my life in such a powerful way. Now I've been able to pass it around to men on the inside and talks about uh, the fiery work of the Holy Spirit that God is doing on the inside in prison. Um, I want to just tell you, um, the reason I bring it up is I have to share this story, Psalm 91 story, because it's just so powerful. Um, some of you might know a little bit more about the situation than others, but Zach had a cellmate who um, we've been praying for for quite a while. Um, there was some significant deliverance ministry that happened in his life a, a few months back. He did... Uh, proclaim faith in Jesus Christ, and yet there. Let me just say, there's a, a lot of work to be done, a long, long way to go, and um, things were were uh, dangerous. Um, he, with, without going into too many details, just recently, he had gotten high on on meth, and was for. Um, 25 straight hours, his mouth was moving, he's babbling, blasphemies coming out of his mouth, he's crawling around on the floor like a snake, curled up with his back in the wrong way, screaming obscenities and blasphemies, and, and this went on and on and on and on, and um, uh, for 25 straight hours. And um, it just so happened that it happened on Christmas Eve going into Christmas Day, and Zach had a very special visit with family members, uh, six family members, her two brothers, uh, Stephanie's two brothers, and her sister-in-law. 
and uh, the two nephews, along with Stephanie, the six of them went to visit Zach. That's the limit on how many can go in. He had been up all night because of this, he hadn't slept any, and, uh, but yet they had an amazing visit. Then he goes back to the jail cell, and uh, it was still going on. It hadn't slowed down a bit. And after 24 straight hours of this, um, his celly, um, his lips were parched and cracked and bleeding. His tongue was swollen and blood is dripping out of his mouth because he's screaming, if you can imagine, at the top of his lungs for 24 straight hours. And um, he had bruises on his face where he would take his own fist and beat himself. And he had bruises all over his legs where he would pound on himself and just beat himself senseless. And uh, at one point, another inmate looked in the room to see if Zach was okay and says, uh, says to him, are you okay? Zach had headphones on. He, he didn't hear him because he just mouthed it. He didn't say the words, but he just looked in his head. And so Zach takes his headphones off and says, what? What did you say? And he says, are you okay? And um, his cellmate, possessed by demons, screamed out, he's just fine. He's protected by God. And um, then at one point, an, another cellmate physically restrained him for 30 minutes, just trying to bring some calm to the situation. But yet it went on and on and on. And finally, Zach was so tired. And at the 24-hour mark, he, he said these words out loud, Father, please make him stop. I'm so exhausted. I need rest. And then he prayed the words of Psalm 91, verse 1. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall find rest under the shadow of the Almighty. And the moment that he said the word rest, instant quiet. The cellmate just with Zach said he went from 100 miles per hour to nothing. I could try to impersonate like what the sound would be, but I wouldn't do it justice. But it was, ah, instantly quiet. His arms went limp and Zach was in the bottom bunk. He looked up and he, he thought, is he quiet? Then he said, after 15 seconds of silence, are you kidding me? <laughs> he got up and looked at him. Man, he was out cold as a mackerel. He was just dead quiet. And uh, they have a little hole where the cable feeds through the wall. And the cellmate was watching all this, you know, from the other side of the wall. He's looking through. He's, and, and he's saying something to Zach. And Zach just says, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and he was absolutely quiet for five minutes until some, the nurse had to come in to do medicines. And the, the person on the other side, when they closed the cell door, they slammed it shut or whatever, whatever with the airlocks. And boom, I mean, he came awake and he's just screaming again. And, and this went on for 25 hours. I mean, at the 25th hour, finally, they, come, they came and took him away. Um, but that was a miracle, and it, it, uh, I would really encourage you, pray Psalm 91, because there is power in the Holy Word, and um, I just had to share that with you. Psalm 46, um, it, it, let me give you a little bit of introduction before we get into the verses. It is like Psalm 91. Uh, Psalm 46, 11 says, The Lord Almighty is with us. Psalm 91, 15 says, I will be with him in trouble. Both of them reinforce this idea of God as Emmanuel. He is with us. Emmanuel, our God, is with us. And because God is with us, you will see in verse 2, when, we, when we're reading it in just a moment, we will not fear. You do not have to fear when God is with you. Um, just like it said in Psalm 91, 5, um, you will not fear. And for that matter, Psalm 23, 4, we read the 23rd Psalm three weeks ago, and, and that one, uh, when we studied it, remember this, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Your rod and your staff comfort me. 
So to put it succinctly, if you wanted to sum up Psalm 46, it's this. We can trust God. Or to use the wording of the psalm itself, God is our refuge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's Psalm 46. Um, refuge is the key word uh, both in Psalm 46 and Psalm 91. This is another way that the two of them are similar. In Psalm 91, it's verse 2, verse 4, and verse 9. All three of them speak up about God being our refuge. Well, the word refuge shows up in Psalm 46 too in a big way. Uh, obviously, verse 1, we're going to read that one, but also... Verses 7 and 11, the word fortress. Now, here's something that's pretty interesting. Fortress um, is a different Hebrew word than uh, what appears in Psalm 46. It's, it, I should say Psalm 46 verse 1 is the word refuge, same as in Psalm 91. But then Psalm 46 has this other word. It's not the same word refuge, but it's the same idea. Um, the two words are synonyms, and, and in fact, the New Revised Standard Version uses the word refuge both times. So, um, I guess the main difference between Psalm 91 and Psalm 46 is this. Psalm 91 is personal, but Psalm 46 is national. Um, in Psalm 46, it is a national banner. God is protecting Israel. God is protecting His people. And, and you'll see that specifically it focuses on the city of Jerusalem. It's referred to as the city of God. And it also refers to the location of the temple, the holy place where the Lord Most High dwells. So Psalm 46 joins with some other psalms that are... Um, speaking of the protection of Jerusalem and Israel. And sometimes those psalms are called the Songs of Zion. Um, just, uh, just for the record, you know, for those of you who are keeping score at home, if you're interested, Psalm 46, Psalm 48, Psalm 76, Psalm 84, um, Psalm 87, Psalm 122, and Psalm 132. All of those are grouped together because they are about the Holy Land and about the protection of the Holy Land. Uh, in Old Testament Hebrew thought, to visit the temple in Jerusalem was the equivalent of experiencing the very presence of God. The, the very place where God intersects with humanity and, and um, His visible signs are there, His presence, the power of God. And so, in a sense, all of these songs of Zion that I just spoke about, uh, all of them are saying that, hey, this is God's universe. And I like that, don't you? This, this is God's land. This is God's temple. This is God's nation. And by extension, in the New Testament, because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross, this is God's people all over the world. Anyone who calls upon Him, it's God's universe. And um, actually, this is just interesting. We're not even in the psalm yet. But psalm 46 and Psalm 48, both of them are songs of Zion. And that is very intentional because sandwiched in between those two psalms, you have Psalm 47. It's a psalm all about God's kingship extending all across the world. World dominance. God is in charge of the world. God claims all the peoples of the world. World dominance. Universe dominance. It's His universe. Um, however, just like we saw in Psalm 23 and in Psalm 29, just, uh, I should have said, and in Psalm 91, so we, we saw it in Psalm 23 and in Psalm 91. But just because God promises to protect us doesn't mean that it's going to be an easy, carefree existence. Sure. Psalm 23, 4, he takes us through the darkest valley. Yeah. Psalm 91, 15, 
He is with us in times of trouble. So yes, sometimes we might have to face difficulties, but God promises that He's always going to be with us and walk right through it with us. He truly is God who is with us. Amen. All right, Psalm 46, verse 1 through 3 starts off like this. Uh, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. Um, hey, if, if you thought it was bad a couple of weeks ago, Psalm 23, when, when, you know, when you were a sheep and you're following your shepherd along a dangerous path up to the green pasture. I mean, this is way worse. You ain't seen nothing yet. I mean, we're talking about this dangerous, dangerous situation. The whole earth is in jeopardy in verses 1 through 3. The whole earth is shaking. Look at what it says. The mountains fall into the heart of the sea. The waters of the sea roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. Um, you could read this, you might think, um, horrible tsunami. I mean, that's what I'm picturing. But actually, it's worse than that. The Hebrews understood the mountains to be the foundations. I mean, there was, not in a literal way, but in a folklore kind of way, they, to the Hebrew mind, the mountain was the foundation that held up the sky. And the mountain was the foundation for holding up the earth. And so for a Hebrew to say, the mountains are quaking, man, this is apocalypse. This is the end of it all. It, the, the very foundations are falling apart. And yet, even in the midst of total annihilation, destruction of the cosmos, we will not fear, it says. We will not fear. We do not have to be afraid. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Uh, we're not afraid of chariots or charioteers or horses. Or to bring it into more modern times, we're not afraid of Abram tanks. We're not afraid of ground-based rocket launchers or EIDs. We are not afraid of those things. Uh, we are not even afraid of nuclear weapons mm -hmm. or even of rocket men, dare I say. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, I mean, if, if a person was just living in the natural and didn't have a spiritual base, and you've got two world leaders going back and forth in comments saying, oh yeah, I've got a nuclear button on my desk. Yeah, well mine actually works. <laughs> Boy, in the natural way of thinking. But you know what? We don't fear because we know that this is God's earth. And it will spin the exact amount of revolutions that he decides it will revolve. I mean, he's already determined the exact timing of, of all things. So, um, so we are not afraid. I love that. Therefore, we will not fear. Now, verse 4, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. That city of God, that's Jerusalem. That's what it's speaking of here. Whose streams make glad the city of God. It is a reference, it has a double entendre. It's speaking of a time when the city of God that's spoken of in the New Testament sits, comes out of the heavens. And uh, it is that city whose builder and maker is God. But Jerusalem, Yeru Shalom, city of peace. Jerusalem has never known peace. That's right. That's right. Isn't that something? But it will. Yes, amen. When the Prince of Peace lands his foot on Mount Olivet and it splits wide open and, and we will see him coming in all of his glory. 
boy, that city will know peace. And it says, the holy place where the Most High dwells. I love this. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. Amen. The earth melts. That's a powerful voice. Yes. Yes. You know, the situation is unsettling. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. Uh, verse 2, the earth gives way. The mountains fall. The Hebrew word... It's, it's repeated there, and it means literally just to shake. It, it means um, just shaking at, at the very foundation. It, it's repeated several times. Kingdoms fall, earth melts. It's all this idea behind it of shaking going on. Um, this could be re reflecting political turmoil. Um, nations against nation, that's already been alluded to. It could even, in modern times, for us, it could refer to terrorist acts. I mean, don't you think? Oh, you could talk about all, all, it could cover all of those things um, in our time, and that's how we would translate it. But the point is this, in the midst of all this craziness, in the midst of all of this turmoil, we do not fear, because God is our stability. Amen. God is our ground. Yes. We are grounded in Him. We trust Him, not any other source. And so because of that, uh, we have nothing to fear. And so, let the world's systems teeter and totter. I mean, that's, it's just doing what we would expect it to do. That's what a world system does. Right. It's built on false ideas. But God will not be shaken. Yeah. That's right. he, his is an unshakable kingdom. Yes. Wow. Praise That's powerful. Yes. Amen. The God that we serve, his, his kingdom is unshakable. Amen. Nothing can touch it. So, but not only is this idea of shaking repeated all throughout these first six verses, but you know what you also have? There's also another word that's repeated. It's the word help. God is our help. Um, just as you look back through here, verse 1, God our refuge and our strength and ever-present help in time of trouble. Verse 5, God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her. At the break of day. God is our helper. Yes, he is. But sometimes you just need to remind yourself of that. If you get so weary and, and just so exhausted by some of the battles that you face, and, and you just think, how can I how can I go on? It's too hard. Listen, God is with you yeah. and He is helping you. Yeah. He is your helper. Um I was just thinking of this, so many politicians and their strategists build their whole campaigns just around um, this idea of a politics of, of fear. Um, I mean, whether intentionally or not, I, I, sometimes I think it's very intentional. But, but for us, we don't buy into the lie of fear. God yes. is with us. Yes. And if you don't hear anything else I said tonight, take that with you. God is with you. Do not fear. Okay, reading on verse 7, the Lord Almighty is with us. It's the same idea uh, from the name Emmanuel. He is the with us God. God is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations He has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters. Uh, he breaks the bow. It's not a boat. It's a, a bow. Yeah. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. Amen. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. 
Um, notice the careful wording of scripture because it's teaching us something important. It doesn't say God is on our side. It's just a slight little difference. But what it says is God is with us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think that we very often we would like to think, well, God's on my side, and I, I want to believe that, I hope that. But, but I don't think that's the accurate way of thinking of it. It's not as if, well, I've got God on my side, but rather God chooses to be with us. And, and I guess I'm thinking more in a national way. Um, actually, uh, God doesn't say in his word that he is on the side of the United States. I want to hope and believe he is. He, actually, here's what I believe about that. God told Abraham, I will bless those who bless you. That's right. And I will curse those who curse you. Yeah. And you, this is not a political statement, but when President Trump recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, Notice primarily the nations that hated that and came out and made public statements about it. It was the five giant nations surrounding Israel who have hated her since her inception. That's right. Um, I've, I've noticed that historically the nations that bless Israel are themselves right. blessed. Mm -hmm. The ones who curse Israel, boy, they have difficult times. And uh, I... I would much rather say that I'm on God's side than to say, oh, I've got God on my side. I want to say, I'm on God's side. And uh, now, you know, you know that I am in favor of just war. In fact, if you missed the teaching on Psalm 23, I would encourage you to go back and watch it. It's on the website. Just go on and watch that teaching because Psalm 23 gives a profound statement about the cause of just war. Um, so I do believe that um, war is, is necessary. Every person that I've ever known who was involved in war hates war. I don't know anybody that says, I just love war for war's sake alone. Um, but Jesus himself said wars will continue right up to the end. In fact, someone did a study one time to see, was there ever a time when wars ceased on the earth? And there has not been. There has always been war happening in this earth at some point since hundreds and hundreds of years before Christ even came on the scene. And those wars have continued up until present times. Um, so, so don't think that, you know, is old Pastor Keith, is he a pacifist? Is he, is he not in favor of military? No. I mean, I hope you know um, my own son and daughter-in-law are on the other side of the world right now. She's in the Air Force. We believe in military. We thank God for our military personnel. We pray regularly for our, for our military. Um, but... This is just an interesting psalm here. It really, um, it, con it concludes this whole section. Actually, this whole psalm. <laughs> that wasn't me, was it? No. That's out there? Okay. Okay. Man, that kind of big ending. I didn't know that. Time to wake up. <laughs> so, I hope all of you are awake. Now. <laughs> Psalm 46, though, it, it, it's ending with this section um, that dreams for the day when there will be no more wars. And it actually is speaking prophetically the same kinds of things that Isaiah 2 and Micah 4 speak of. Um, when, when war has ended, and I, I think it's just a beautiful verse, he makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear and burns the shields with fire. Um, I don't remember if it's Isaiah, I think it is, that speaks about 
taking their spears and bending them and turning them into... Um, God is going to do something so amazing. So while we're here on this earth, um, sin is raging and um, disease is rampant through the earth. God heals supernaturally. We've seen so many times God's healing um, of people who have named diseases, sicknesses that are undeniable, verified by a doctor, but we speak healing in the name of Jesus. And some of the times it absolutely just amazes me the healing power that is available to us. Amen. And then we also have a prayer warrior like a Joanne Bost that I, I can't think of anyone who spent more time in prayer than that dear woman. That's right. And, and she went home to be with the Lord. Yeah. And do you know what? She's experiencing this Psalm 46 uh, verses 7 through 10 thing right now. There is no more pain. There is no more war. There's no more. It's, I mean, well, I guess the only war I should say is if you, get to the, if you get the experience of being in heaven and you get to have that vantage point of riding back with him on a white horse wearing white robes with on his thigh it's imprinted King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. I mean, if you call that war, okay. Uh, but he's going to establish his kingdom forever and ever. Um, if I understand it correctly, I think that we get to do that after the rapture of the church. I think uh, if I'm reading it right, he says, okay, boys, do a U-turn because we're headed back. And we're going to take over. Um, but this, this is just an interesting verse here because after all of this, um, and, and think about this. So war ceases to the ends of the earth, breaks the bow, shatters the spear, burns the shields, and then after that, he says, be still and know that I am God. So sometimes we like to think of that verse, be still and know that I am God. And we picture little happy angels strumming the heart, <laughs> sitting on puffy little clouds, and everything's so peaceful. It seems to me that God is saying, wipe out all war forever and then appreciate that stillness in that setting. And so, um, in fact, um, J. Clinton McCann says this. I love this quote. This verse is an interesting verse that calls for the nations of the world for a universal ceasefire. And here's his quote. He says, it would be better translated as stop it. <laughs> or more, to use a paraphrase, drop your guns. I love that. To know that God is with us means not the courage to wage war, but rather the courage to wage peace. Amen. Wow, that's quite a statement. And then he closes with this, verse 11. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. This is, um, this is the very verse that Martin Luther was thinking of when he quoted, when, when he wrote his famous hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. He took it from Psalm 46, verse 11. The God of Jacob is our fortress. <clears throat> Luther lived in a time when, um, well, it was coming right off of the dark ages of the church, honestly, uh, in the early 1500s, late 1400s, when it, he began his, his passionate cause, he realized the church of Jesus Christ has become so cold and so indifferent and so formal. <coughs> And um, people are going into these buildings and they're listening to a man speak in Latin, but they don't even speak Latin. And they don't even understand what he's saying. And they're lighting candles and they're being told, if you light a candle, then you can have, you can have your way paved to heaven. And if you give extra money, guess what? We can get you a nicer spot. At the, you know, we can move you up a little higher. And if you give a whole lot of money, Hey, we can get Uncle Freddy um, out of yeah, you know, out of purgatory and make him go to heaven too. Yeah. I mean, it had big. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not joking. It was called the cell of indulgences. It was a very serious problem 
in the Catholic Church. And thankfully, I have seen in the last 50 years changes in the Catholic Church. And then sometimes I say, oh man, they're kind of sliding back. Then I, you know, but I, I believe this. I believe that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is saved. And if they love Jesus, then they're saved. But it had gotten really bad the end of the 1400s and going into the 1500s. And finally, on October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther took his, his complaints, um, his 95 theses, he tacked them to the door of the Wittenberg Castle. It was not really a, a rebellious act. This is the way that you would have protested. And it was sort of like, I'm taking you to court. I'm doing this the legal way. He knew that it would cost him dearly. He appeared before um, religious leaders at the Diet of Worms, and he, he had to explain himself. And he was renounced and kicked out of the Catholic Church. And, and uh, the Lutheran Church today mm -hmm. is the one of the results of that, um, just one of many denominations. Um, but Luther said, it's by faith that a person is saved in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Scriptura solo, scripture only, fast solo, faith only. Um, and and he, he read Romans chapter 1, 16 and 17, and it's called Luther's Gate. That, I love that scripture. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to them that believe. And he wrote a very famous hymn right out of this scripture, A mighty fortress is our God. I think that it's going to take some of us being daring like Martin Luther was back then in our day. What will it be like for you? What will be required of you? Um, what will your faith require of you? I don't know. I don't know exactly where all the world is headed, but I do know, I know this. God is with us. And a mighty fortress is our God. Let's bow our heads and pray. And remember that we're praying for some other needs as well as we close tonight. <coughs> Heavenly Father, um, tonight we, we are thankful to you for all of your blessings. You have told us that even if the mountains quake and fall into the sea, yet even still you are with us. And so we will not fear, we will not be afraid. You're speaking to our hearts. Be still and know that I am God. I just pray that you would be still over Michael and Debbie Hoko tonight. Debbie's facing some very serious things. Let them experience the stillness of God, the peace of God, the fact that you are with them. Um, Lord, let them know your peace. And then um, uh, Deborah requested prayer for her and her family. They've experienced sickness. They are not the only ones. There's been so much sickness. But be still over them, Lord. Let your healing flow Amen. through every family um, here in our valley that's been battling sickness. Drive it out of, our, out of our city. Drive it out of this valley, we pray. Lord, we ask that you would just go with us from this place tonight in power as a testimony of your greatness. We keep asking that you crisscross our paths with people that are searching for answers. And help us to be like salt in the earth. Help us to be like light in the world. Let us be ready to give a reason for the hope that we have inside of us, O oh God. We pray in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen and amen. amen. Lord bless all of you. We'll see you back here Sunday morning. Have a great night.